What's this? I got a box of chocolates from that fool He-Man? Ah, uh, what's the harm? Ah! Curse you, He-Man! Curse you! Howdy folks, my name is Richie, aka Bog Otter, and welcome back to another episode of Guild Wars 2 Boomerangs. What's a Guild Wars 2 Boomerang? Well, it's somebody who has played the game in the past, has taken a break of varying length, and is now returning to the game and trying to get back up to speed. This is the fifth episode of Boomerangs, and this time we're focusing on changes to structured PvP. A lot has changed on the PvP front since the launch of the game, so let's dive in. The main game mode for structured PvP is still Conquest. Two teams battle for control of three capture nodes across the map to gain points. The first team to 500 points is declared the victor. In addition to the capture nodes, each map also includes a secondary mechanic which, depending on the map, may give useful buffs, additional points, or siege to help turn the tides of a battle. At the launch of Guild Wars 2, there were four conquest maps. Battle of Kylo, Legacy of the Fofire, Raid on the Capricorn, and Forest of Nif... I never knew how to say that. The Raid on the Capricorn map featured something that was fairly unique. A lot of the map was underwater, including one of the three capture nodes. But with April 2014's feature pack, underwater combat was removed from structured PvP entirely, including the Raid on the Capricorn map. Apologies to any Aquamen out there who are sporting those legendary underwater weapons. Back to PvE for you! Since launch, three additional Conquest maps have been released. The first new map was the Temple of the Silent Storm, and that was released in November 2012 during the Lost Shores patch. This map is Kodan themed, is designed with a lot of verticality, and the secondary mechanic revolves around commune points that will spawn at specific places at specific times. Meditating at these commune points unlocks buffs for your team that can increase the amount of points you get per kill, increase the amount of points you get for holding nodes, and there's even one that allows you to immediately flip all control points to your team. It's totally cheating. The next map introduced was Spirit Watch. This was released in February 2013's content patch Flame and Frost the Gathering Storm. In addition to the standard conquest features, Spirit Watch also has a single flag capture mechanic. An orb of light will appear in the middle of the map and players can carry that orb to one of the control nodes to capture it for their team. Bringing the orb to an allied controlled node scores 30 points, while a neutral node is only worth 15. Take the orb to an enemy node, however, and you'll score 15 points and instantly neutralize the node. In July of 2013, the Bazaar of the Four Winds added a final conquest map called Skyhammer. Skyhammer features many edges and breaking platforms that will lead to a player's death if they fall off or through them. Knockbacks are totally fun. The secondary mechanic for this map, however, is a giant laser cannon floating above the map. Either team can gain control of this cannon, which allows the player controlling the cannon to send targeted laser strikes down anywhere on the map. Capturing the laser cannon itself gives no points to help a team win, but you've got control of a giant cannon to shoot things and win. The April 2014 feature pack added an additional map to structured PvP, but it wasn't a conquest one. Unlike all the previous maps, Courtyard does not have any conquest control points. This smaller map was created for team deathmatch and dueling competitions hosted by the community. As it was created for the community hosted events only, team deathmatch is still not an officially supported game type and is not part of the arena and tournament rotation. Speaking of arenas, those have changed as well. At launch, there were two types of queued competitive play, paid and free tournaments. These consisted of three round, single elimination tournaments where eight teams battled to victory. Paid and free tournaments then became three round and one round tournaments that were both free for players to enter but tournaments have now been thrown away altogether in exchange for arenas. Team and solo arenas are both free, one round matches. Solo arena is solo queue only and includes all of the current conquest maps in its rotation. Team arena allows any size party to queue up, including solo players, and includes all conquest maps except for Spirit Watch and Skyhammer. ArenaNet has also added custom arenas. Now, custom arenas are player-owned and managed arenas that are part of the hot join, less competitive system. Players can purchase a custom arena or time tokens from a vendor in the mists to create a new arena and customize many of the options, including map rotations, scoring limit, respawn parameters, and time limits. You can also set your arena up to be a public or private with reserved slots for specific players or entire guilds. 
With a starter kit, the custom arena will last 30 days, but you can buy custom arena time tokens to add more time and anyone can contribute to this. And did I mention that everything is a lot more accessible now? You no longer need to talk to an NPC to queue up to join a PvP match. There's a new PvP UI which includes access to your stats, the queue for team and solo arenas, the full hot join server list, and a tab to manage any custom arenas you own. There's also a tab for the new reward track system, but more on that later. In addition to the expanded PvP UI, there is also a new PvP launch bar at the top of the window that shows up all times while the players are in the mists. While in a match, the bar is hidden by default, but it will slide down when the cursor is near. The launch bar gives quick access to the new PvP build window and the hot join server list and arena queue tabs of the PvP window. The PvP build window is the new one-stop location for making your perfect PvP build. Sorry for slipping into infomercial mode there, but the first tab of this window shows your currently selected weapons, sigils, runes, and amulet, as well as your character's current stats in PvP. Some of the big differences with this system are that sigils and runes are no longer applied to items in PvP, but have their own item slots. Additionally, runes in PvP are now a single item that grants all six tiers of the slotted rune, and amulets no longer have slots for upgrade components. These changes drastically reduce the time it takes to switch up your build. To change out any of the sigils, runes, or amulets, you simply need to click on the slot, and the left side of the window will fill in with respective items. These lists are not of actual items that are consumed, but account-wide unlocks. Every player will have access to the majority of sigils, runes, and amulets, but there are a few that require a set amount of gold to unlock. Sigils cost 3 gold, runes cost 5 gold, and amulets cost 10 gold. If they add any new sigils, runes, or amulets in the future, you will also have to unlock them. That also goes for skills and traits that they may add. All of the original skills and traits that launch with the game are considered the core skills and traits, and they will be already unlocked in PvP for all existing and new characters. Unlike sigils, runes, and amulets, unlocking skills and traits is a character-specific unlock. So if you want to unlock that on multiple characters, you have to do it multiple times. Unlocking skills requires skill points, which can be acquired through the new PvP reward tracks. Again, more on that later. Quit bugging me! Unlocking traits requires either going into PvE and completing certain challenges, or using a combination of gold and skill points at a trainer. To unlock your new traits, a row of class trainers has been added to the Heart of the Mists. I don't know why I said it like that. It just felt right. Are you worried about not being able to earn gold in PvP? Ah! Aha! In place of glory, playing PvP awards a set amount of gold now. Winning will give the player 30 silver for team arenas, 25 silver for solo arenas, and 15 silver for custom arenas and hot join matches. Losing a match gives you less silver, which makes sense because you're a loser. Additionally, the amount of rank points given from both wins and losses of all modes has been greatly buffed, allowing players to rank up even faster. In addition, all ranks of 39 and above have had their rank point requirements reduced. These ranks now all require a flat 20,000 rank points to rank up. This new system took the total rank points acquired into account, and any player who was ranked 54 plus before the April 2014's feature pack is now sitting pretty at rank 80, which is the rank cap. With PvP armor and weapons being removed, the rewards for ranking up in PvP have changed. Upon ranking up, players will receive a chest that includes crafting materials, leveling up tomes, and skill point scrolls. These tomes and scrolls give your character a single PvE level, as well as the skill point that comes with leveling up, and a single skill point respectively. Once players reach rank 80, they can continue to gain rank points and rank up. While your rank will remain at 80, you will continue to gain additional rank up chests. This system allows players who enjoy structured PvP to actually level up a character in case they want to try things out like World vs. World or PvE content. If you watched my last Guild Wars 2 Boomerang video, you'll know all about a new wardrobe system, which basically did away with PvP-only skins and PvE-only skins. It's all merged now, you unlock weapons and armors on your account, and you can use it in any game mode that you desire. The new PvP reward track system will allow you to collect even more skins while doing PvP, as well as valuable items used in crafting new gear, additional transmutation charges, and more level up tones and skill point scrolls. Okay, okay, I'll finally tell you what the PvP reward track system is. It's basically a feature design that allows you to unlock different types of rewards while doing the content that you like, structured PvP. Have you been drooling over those dungeon armor sets but afraid you'll melt if you step in a PvE instance? Fear not! The reward track system allows you to unlock these dungeon armors and other rewards just by doing PvP. 
Currently, there is one PvP track, eight dungeon tracks, and five region tracks. The dungeon reward tracks give weapon and armor skins as well as dungeon tokens from the specific dungeon. Regional tracks give weapon skins and loot drops from the mobs common to that region. The single PvP track's big reward is a unique backpack skin that only can be required through this PvP-only reward track. The September 2014 feature pack added a final reward track, and completing the glorious reward track awards players with pieces from an entirely new armor set. It's basically a way to get those PvE collectors to try out some PvP. Oh god, it burns! It burns! The dungeon and region tracks can be repeated multiple times, which give players the ability to eventually unlock all of the dungeon and region skins through this system. Some tracks need to be unlocked before you can access them, though. The regional tracks are unlocked sequentially. You'll start with the Crichton regional track and then progress through the other areas. The dungeon tracks are a bit unique in that they are temporarily unlocked. Every two weeks, a new dungeon track is rotated in while the previous one is then locked. Players, however, can permanently unlock all of the dungeon reward tracks by going and completing the story mode instance of the specific dungeon. It's basically a way to get those PvP guys into the dungeons. You see what they're doing? They're mixing us up! They're making us play together! No! Now let's talk about those PvP finishers. They are getting ridiculous and hilarious. They are no longer consumables that create the specific finish animation for a set amount of time. All of the rank finishers are now permanent and unlimited, as well as any finishers that are bought in the gem store. Some finishers can be obtained in a consumable version in-game, such as special holiday finishers. These consumable versions, however, are no longer time-based, but usage-based. Finishers are now displayed in a new section of the hero panel, and you can preview each one of them so you can see what they look like before you buy them. Let's wrap up by talking about how daily and monthly achievements have changed. There is no longer a split between PvP and the rest of the game, just a single daily and single monthly category. You need five daily achievements completed to finish the daily, and four monthly achievements to finish the monthly. And the biggest change for PvP players is that the daily and monthly will not be easy to complete solely in PvP. So again, they want you to step out and join the rest of the game. I know it hurts, but you can do it. I believe in you. And that's going to wrap things up for another Guild Wars 2 Boomerang video. I hope you found this helpful. If you did, I'd appreciate you hitting that like button and sharing this video with your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you can be notified when I release future videos. If you want to contact me, my contact info is in the description below. I'm on the Twitters. I'm on the Facebook. I'm on Twitch. I have a Patreon page. And a very special thanks to my friend Monster Ninja who wrote the script for this video. Thank you so much. Go follow him in all the places I've linked down below. Go click all the links. Now, go, go. And I hope you have a fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Take care.